Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to Bridging the Gap, a conversation on stimulating the housing market. Being held by the National Housing Trust in association with the Incorporated Master Builders Association of Jamaica. I'm Dwayne Burbick, I'm Corporate and Public Affairs Manager at the NHG. I'm Delia Alert, I'm the second VP for the IMNG. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon and it forms part of our mandate to advance industry by education, collaboration, um, training, and just general information sharing. So we do hope that this evening, you find this afternoon very informative and educational and also as an avenue which you can um, see what opportunities are available to the different aspects of the industry. Dele mentioned opportunities and I think I mentioned conversation earlier and I think those two words pretty much sum up our focus this afternoon is to have a vibrant conversation amongst all the players in the housing industry to see how we can collaborate and create opportunities and see where opportunities exist so we can fulfill our general and individual mandates which has to do with housing Jamaica. This is the second event that the NHD is having in the series. Uh, we had our inaugural event in November and I to continue this conversation as we work together with all the housing industry players. And before we get into our meals, as we mentioned, it's a collaboration be between the NHT and the Master Builders Association. And we'll ask representatives from both entities to say a few words. We'll begin with Mr. Errol Thompson. He is Senior General Manager for Finance at the NHT and is representing our Managing Director, Mr. Martin Miller, this afternoon. Please make him welcome. I want to say thank you for coming out this afternoon to our stakeholders luncheon. We are pleased to have partnered with the IMAJ for this afternoon's event. We're here to have what I believe is a timely conversation on how we can improve the delivery of housing in Jamaica. We're, you're all here because you play a key role in the process. And I want to thank you for the work that you have been doing to date. The current housing landscape in Jamaica, however, requires us to do more and that is the focus this afternoon. You will hear some plans from the NHD, some new and some we have reviewed and made improvements to. So I encourage you all to participate in the discussion and I hope that we will leave here with a renewed focus as we work to increase the supply of housing for all Jamaicans. Thanks again and enjoy the lunch, enjoy the conversation and the afternoon. Thank you. The IMAJ, as part of its mandate, um, seeks to educate, inform, and promote developments within the industry, primarily to our members and the wider industry. However, we don't limit it there. We do invite members of other, what we call, more public organizations, the civil servants, the unions who are also our partners, the nurses, the police, and so on. We try to keep everybody informed, but our focus is largely on the industry players. We really are grateful for this opportunity to jointly with the NHT have a discussion on housing. And part of this is to help us to have an appreciation as players of what the plans are for housing. Because when you don't know what the plans are, when the plans are about to start, that's when you know. And what it does is when you know beforehand, you can be prepared beforehand. So if training is required, if you need to build out some capacity, if you need to try and acquire additional plant and equipment and so on, it does prepare you. It goes both for contractors, service providers, suppliers and so on. When you know what's going on, you can get in early. And that's, that's a part of what the conversation today is intended to achieve. This is about business. It is about development. Another tier in our 
partnership uh, with the NHGs to look at education and training to continue to improve the skills, the offerings within the industry from the tradesmen right up to the managerial level and the technical is included. And we will advise in the future when those will be forthcoming, we ask that you be mindful that we are having a tradesmen workshop at the end of April. Um, and this is for steel workers, so contractors, please make note we'll be having a workshop for steel men in, a, in conjunction with the hard trust. We certainly would want to also take time to mention some of the issues that trouble us as contractors. And we will be lobbying for a lien law. I don't know many of us would have seen in a few Sundays ago um, some subcontractors out in the West um, had not been paid for a project they worked on and it was deemed that the main contractor had departed the shores. Now, you see, a lien law mitigates these kind of things. It ensures that everybody is paid. It ensures that the suppliers are paid, as the, you know, Sherwin Williams and others are among us. Um, it ensures that suppliers are paid. It ensures that subcontractors are paid. And very important to the master builders, it ensures that contractors are paid. Um, remember that when you're starting your projects, you have to put up a, a bond, a performance bond. So there is something for the client to hold on to. But the, the, the contractor clutches at straws. So we love being for a lane law and additionally also a margin of preference. We have large players on our shores and our local contractors, our local service suppliers must be protected. We thank you for coming out as we the IMAJ continues to work to improve efficiency, sustainability, and the integrity of the industry. Thank you. Well, we're now down to our main presentation um, entitled Bridging the Gap, which looks at partnership in housing development. And as we mentioned earlier, you will hear in this presentation some of the plans that the NHG has as it relates to housing construction, the NHG's housing plan for the four-year period 20. 17 going up to 2021 and you will hear some of the initiatives under which you can partner with the NHT as we move to add to the housing stock in Jamaica. Our main presenter this afternoon, his name is Mr. Donald Moore. He's our Senior General Manager for Construction and Development and I'm sure he's no stranger to you in this room. So put your hands together and please make welcome Mr. Moore. So we want to thank the IMAJ for in a sense inviting us to have these luncheons, I understand, and so we were quite happy to partner with the IMAJ. As the NHT has consistently said, we are about partnerships. There is no area that we operate in that we believe is ours. We, we expect as much as possible to be partnering with whoever else will wish to operate within that space, within that area. And so the, this presentation is, is entitled Bridging the Gap. Because in, in housing, as, as long as I've been in it, we have always heard about the gap between that which is provided and that which is needed. And so we have sought to ramp up our partnerships throughout the various areas of housing. No matter what area it is, we will be looking, we are looking at partnering with whomever is out there to be able to satisfy the demands that are there. <coughs> so, 
to the NHT, the who we are. And, and we all, I'm sure everybody here, being part of the NHT as contributors, would know exactly who we are. But just to share a little bit the vision of the NHT, that we will be ranked, we will be ranked, among the leading housing financing institutions in the world, renowned for customer service and contribution to national development. And, and uh, if I were to take a poll, I'm sure you'll all agree that we are not doing such a bad job of it right now. But we continue, thank you, thank you so much, <clears throat> to seek to, to get better all the time. Our mission is improving the quality of life of Jamaicans by facilitating home ownership and community development, partic particularly among low-income earners. And, and to be honest with you, that is one area I think we, I was going to say, we are falling shortish. But we all need to pay particular attention to. Because we are all aware of the informal settlements and so on around. And until we are able to, to meaningfully deal with some of those issues, the growth and all of those other things that we, we all want to see probably won't happen. So I think we need to put our collective minds and thoughts to how we are going to partner to start to address those, those areas, <clears throat> and that area in particular. The, what we do, what is it that NHT does as far as housing is concerned? We generate funding for the construction of homes and to promote improved building systems and greater efficiency. All right, so the first part, we, are, we lend money all over the place, we mortgage funding, we engage with consultants, contractors, and so on. But we are always seeking to improve the, the speed, the efficiency of housing construction. We now have a program, an R&D program, we are looking at alternative building systems, separate and apart from those which we use concrete-based system which we use all the time. Of course, you hear that we, we want to get a system and, and a building envelope um, method that will give us something that will prevent bullets from passing through, you know? <laughs> well, uh, so I hear all the time, but I think we need to probably get more of the guns off of the street and then go in a different direction. <coughs> But uh, we need to collaborate on this. We need to be talking about it. We need to, to see how the efficient systems will also ensure that our people are employed. It is one of the challenges that we have had when we go to tender and, and we talk about giving a, giving a margin of preference for the conventional. Because it is seen as an area that will sop up that low skill demand for work that is out there. It is something we need to look at and we need to see, of course, with training and so on, to get people moving up that value chain so that we would not need, if, any, if we need to have anybody working in the, you know, pushing barrels and stuff like that, we import them. So we stop worrying about a man coming in to push bar to take away Jamaican work, but that we need some man coming in to push bar because the Jamaicans are operating at a higher, higher value added le level. It is something we really need to give thought to. We provide loans to build, to buy, and to repair homes. And we have been doing this for as long as I've been at the NHC, and that's been a while, and I, I suppose we'll continue to do that. But certainly, how can we start to effect that lower 
income levels. We are we mandate increase and enhance the stock of available housing in Jamaica. So we are happy, 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 happy when we hear a developer doing a thousand houses or so someplace. It, we're not sad. We're not saying, boy, somebody is going to be competing with us. That is not what we are about. Every single developer doing every single house out there is a benefit to our mandate. That's what we are about. So currently, um, you, you would have heard the Prime Minister, soon after he became Prime Minister, this time around, talking about his simple mandate for the National Housing Trust, with all of what we have said before. With the vision, with the mission, we have a simple mandate, which I have appreciated quite, quite a bit. It is this, Bill House. That's it. So whenever we sit with the Prime Minister, first question we, are, we have to answer, how are we doing with that part? Bill House. So he had set a target of 23,000 housing starts by 2021, and that was over a four-year period. Well, for 2017-18, we started 5,500. For 2018-19, fingers still crossed, we still have a few, even though we are about three days away from the end of the financial year. But, you know, we work all the way down to the last minute. We are expected to start 6,369, 6, there or thereabouts, right? We, expected, we are expecting to exceed that. And for 2019-20, we are expecting to start 8,893. So, you know, getting the big bump because we have been pushing the things in the pipeline, and these are real, this is a real pipeline, incidentally, because you can see the things coming out. So, we expect to start 8,893 solutions. And for 2021, we expect, it to, we expect to push it up to 9,500 or there, thereabouts. So, this then became important because what we are seeing is that, and let me just give you a little story. I went to infrastructure committee of, of cabinet on Monday, yesterday, to get approval for this um, award of contract. And the chairman said to me, say, boy, anytime the NHD come, you know, so we start talking to the bills. So the, the project value, contract value, was over $3 billion. What you're seeing now is that as we push these projects out, the issue of the contractor resources then is called into question. Do we have to seek people from elsewhere to come in? Are we at overload? I'm just putting, putting the questions out there because of what we are seeing because of the work that is being generated out of the National Housing Trust, and because, if we all agree, there are a small number of contractors who can operate with that kind of, of, of sum. It is something we need, the IMAJ must pay attention to. So from the, that big picture, the contractor side, and then you can drill down into the resources details. So um, for, the, for the current year, as of December 2018, we had 24 projects with over 4,800 housing solutions in it. That's under construction. By the end of this month, we'll push that up to 33 projects with over 9,000 housing solutions. And as I'm talking to you now, my, my manager in charge of marketing and sales ran out 
because she had a meeting with a developer to talk about how we can partner to get some of these houses started. So the NHD operates several housing programs. Um, the main one, people would be aware, this is where we have a lot of consultants and contractors working, is our scheme program, where we buy land, we engage consultants to do the development, the, the planning, and to seek approvals from Peter. Where's Peter? Right? Um, and we work very well with NEPA as well um, to, to get approvals so that we can implement. If the NWC don't charge us too much to provide water, right? But we also partner very closely with the NWC. And EG isn't here, but also with the NWA, where we have to build miles of road or, you know, like we're doing. We did Longville, give you a good example. And Longville is on the way down to South Clarendon. A lot of people live down there. All the way down Salt Spring, all of those areas. A lot of people. But because the NHD did Longville, put in probably about at the time about a thousand houses, there was a little fording. And it, whenever it rained, like you know, the Jackson fording and so on and so forth, you can't drive that way. And because this is close to where the entrance to Longville is, it then became an NHD responsibility. So, so we are partnering with putting in even major infrastructure that is used by, by everyone. I, 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 we didn't get, back, get the money back. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's aside. We also have a joint venture program where people with land can come to the NHT and we will agree, arrange to develop the land. We, we provide, in most instances, the project management and also the funding. So those are the two areas that we focus attention on. We, up till now, have not focused attention on putting inside the NHT the consultants, the designers, and so on. As I said, we have tried hard to be in partnerships all the way through. We have a thriving, recently restarted labor and small materials program. This is where we are engaging contractors in grades three and four in particular to build houses within these areas that we would have put in infrastructure. So, two years and a half ago, to, to get started as quickly as we could, we started the infrastructure part of the projects. And then once the infrastructure went in, we then now morphed to getting the small contractors, as we call it, to come in and build houses. So right across Jamaica now, we have small contractors. Currently, I think there are about 40 of them on the list. Because it's an open list, we go out every so often to get them to come in. Right, so we have about 40 persons now, and every six months, I think it is, we invite more persons to come on because it gives the local contractors an opportunity to have constant work. It is important for us to continue to support those grades three and four and allow them to get enough experience and so on so they can become the grade twos. And so that the grade twos, which I've not seen in a long time, can become the grade ones. We I, I have we're in another had been on the the NCC for, for quite a little while. The, the end of this month is my, my, my last, um, this meeting is my last meeting on Wednesday. But I have not seen many contractors 
moving grades over the years. You have a grade three contractor, him is a grade three contractor almost for life. A grade two contractor. So, so we really need to have some support, Mr. Kelly, to, to get the people to put in whatever the structures and so on in place to, to be able to move up the grades. Give them the support. We also have a nascent, in a sense, because I think we have two projects on it, a community renewal program. It's, it's new. We are doing work down in Majestic Gardens right now under this program. We, are, we, are, we, are, we should have started in a little while a project in, on Maxfield, which is to seek to intervene at the level just almost on the edge of, of those contributors to the NHT who are gardeners, household helpers, those, those um, groupings, so that we can start to improve communities and then branch out and use these almost as points of light to, to see if we can influence what happens around the community. So we are in there putting in infrastructure, working with the NWA, NWC to ensure that water, sewage, and so on are provided within them. For, for developers, and, and there's no need for contractors to simply remain people working with us. You have the skill set, you can go ahead and do development. Because the NHT is, and, and it has, has been for a long time, providing financing for construction of houses. So if you are, you see a nice piece of land out there, you, you look at the work for the next two years or so, you look at your staff, you can arrange with some consultants, do some designs, get approvals from NEPA, and come to the NHT for funding for the houses. We will provide funding. Of course, conditions apply, but you can, you can check us early, but, but we will assist because we, we are hoping that all of us will understand that it is in our interest to continue to add value. So no matter where you are on that value chain, how can you step up to the next level is what we should be thinking. And we lend money at, if you, are, if you are building for the lower income levels, you get the money at 3%. You can't beat that. Of course, we insist that the selling prices be geared towards those persons in the lower income levels. And we, all, we joint venture even with developers. We have one of our largest housing developments now is a joint venture with a developer. And it's going very well. We are delivering housing at some of the lowest prices that I see in the marketplace right now through that sort of arrangement. And that is the kind of arrangement we want always to be, to be involved in. So, the, under the Housing Developers Program, which is a new program, launched probably in a kind of situation just like this, about two months ago, Dwayne? November. November, in November. To date, we have about five projects that we have signed off on three. There are two more that we are about to sign off on to deliver about 2,500 housing solutions. So where you are out there, even before we would not want to touch your development, we say go ahead and sell to the marketplace. We have put in a marketing and sales department and we are now buying the units directly from developers and we will sell them 
Of course, conditions apply. But, <laughs> of course, because we are smart people as well. And we, we are always trying to pass a benefit on to our contributors. That's the ultimate role that we play. And therefore, we look at location, we look at price, we look at quality, we look at the track record of the developer, we look at all of those things in deciding who we enter into agreement with. But it is there for persons to come on board. So that program, we call it, the, is a colloquial term. It's the Guaranteed Purchase Program, what we call the Straight Purchase Program, you know? It was straight, just buy it from you, and then we will deal with the marketing and sales. We have a, a lot of competent people in that e area here. If we are paying attention to the NHT and what it is that we do, we also have cluster housing where people can come together, buy a piece of land, it's a, you know, a quarter acre or whatever, and they come together, do a plan, and, and the NHT will finance all of this, you know, finance you acquiring the land, and then finance individuals building within that space. So up to nine persons can come together for under this cluster housing policy. Contractors can also you know, get people interested in doing this so that they can then build the houses for the people. And the NHT will provide financing for, for this development. We also have an... Some of the contractors are huge. They have big staff, hundreds of people. We also joint venture with employers to provide housing for their staff. So if you have a piece of land as an employer, whether you're a contractor or otherwise, the NHT will joint venture with you to provide housing for your staff. And this is directly and directed to your staff. Uh, we, we, we build communities, and we talk about that all the time. What the NHT build communities. So I talk about housing solutions, but these housing solutions are within communities, and, and the NHT spends a lot of its time, and we have resources in place, social development, to provide support we are recently getting into setting the standards for the maintenance of the communities long term. It's something that we have shied away from because we have said, let other people do it. But we are now beginning to see the benefit of setting the standards. Well, you can't build on top of this. You, can, you can't change the face of this house. You can't put in a fence, those kinds of things. As we get into the gated communities, this is something that we need to do because we are trying to preserve value. And, and it is that we meet with the communities and we try to educate them in the benefit of running and maintaining the communities in a particular way so that in the long term, you can see the asset maintaining or even improving its value over time is important. And I think we need to, we are, we are doing more of that as we go on. And I expect that you will see over the next 20, 30 years, more people moving into the cities and towns like happens everywhere else. We are not unique. We talk about being unique. It's time to deal with all of these matters. We're on an island. As the economy grows, people will want to spend their time doing m many more advantageous things than sitting in traffic jams. We we we're not going to want to do that for long. Most of our people moving as the population grows as well into the cities. So we are going to see more apartments. We're seeing them already, you know. But we, we must now think larger. How are we going to properly plan our areas? 
hopefully they, they widen constant spring they widen this and they widen that and we have to do it next year or 10 years from now because it has been done with the bigger picture in mind and so we are expected from a contractor perspective now to move up the chain you're going to be expected not to go build a little one house out there anymore you're going to be expected to build a the towers right so the, the the cranes all the support you need is what you need to be looking at now because i don't 10 years from now i would expect to see 40 cranes constantly in kingston right it it it, it, it can't be otherwise and if you just think about it so the, you, the, the contractors are on the forefront of that. So you need to retool. You need to have people who are forward thinking. We talk about the things like the BIM software, right? How many contractors have worked with a consultant who uses the BIM software? Let me see the hands. Wow, all right, four. Well, I want to tell you, from an NHT standpoint, we are starting to insist that every design done now must be done using that software. That's the direction we're going. Yes, that's the direction we're going. We have to realize that we are going to have to step up to the cutting edge of technology because the benefit is long term we need to get the benefit from using what is out there the nht also to support our marketing department now finances all its solutions whether it's a two bedroom house studio unit <coughs> lot our apartment we provide a hundred percent financing subject to affordability the prime minister would have announced the increase in our loans from 5.5 million to 6.5 million but that was just one part of it we he had spoken long time about nht for its development providing a hundred percent of financing so once you are able to afford it, once you are in the market, we expect that in a few years, you will have no trouble finding housing because we are generating through the partnerships the solutions needed by the marketplace. One of the major areas that we are going to, and I'm talking we know from a contractor perspective, we are going to have to know the government procurement system. We are going EGP, we are going electronic. Paper is going to go the way of some of those other things long time ago. So you have to be computer savvy because everything will be done within that environment. The law, the procurement law was passed a couple of years ago. The regulations are being addressed now, and I understand that come the 1st of April, the new law will be put into effect. So it is important that contractors understand, know what it is, and be able that when they submit their tenders, they're not thrown out for all kind of reasons. We have, we have tried to educate persons to, to put in guidelines, to put in you know, different things for you to be able to use to make sure that you tick all the boxes. But it's important for persons who are putting in tenders to read the instruction to tenders, to tenders, so that when, when the NCC or now the PPC sits, 
they don't have to go through and say, boy, this looks like a good tender from a man with experience, a performer, but guess what? Him supposed to, the band supposed to say this, and him allow the insurance company to give him a band that says something else. Him supposed to sign right or so, but him make the secretary sign him instead. These are all things that happen. That Mark, who is the managing, your managing director, Mark, our president. All right. <laughs> so, so Mark is a president, right? And so he has a board with directors on it. So if Mark signs something, he must have authority to sign it. The question is, how do I know that Mark has the authority to sign it? And it is so for all of the contractors. When you get somebody to sign, if you get the QS to sign, what is the basis of the QS signing your tender document? These are things that must be paid attention to. And I am sure that the PPC will have seminars and so on about that because it's an important part of what we need. We need efficiency in the processes. We need for the people of the country to get the best price that they can get in the competitive environment. To throw people out who are otherwise qualified makes no sense. And so it is something that I'd want the IMAJ to pay attention to so that the contractors are all off with what is required. And as you know, we operate strictly by the tender procedures. And so we are, it pains our heart sometimes when we see that, you know, I could have built that house for $500 cheaper, $500,000 cheaper, but because my friendly contractor was not diligent. I have to go to the unfriendly one. Or otherwise, incidentally. What do we expect of contractors? Now, I, I did a little assessment the other day to see the kind of claims I'm getting for my projects. Because I must tell you, notwithstanding what I've just shared with you, we, we have underspent our budget this year. We have billions of dollars. We have billions of dollars. And we, we have underspent. And I don't like that. Uh, that is one that pains me. Because you know when you underspend, what, 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 what happens sometimes? Man, look and say, oh, you have money over there, so. Yeah? So I don't like that. So what is important is for the contractors to perform, we are, we are seeing and, and we're getting feedback from, let me tell you a little story before I tell you this little part. So I get beat up all the time in my meetings, right? Because some more. You say we all get the house um, this time. My marketing and sales people put all of the thing in place. But all I get is the excuse. Eh? The house them are done. This is almost, I mean, say, all right, let's give it another X time. Some more. Still. So the performance of the contractors affect me personally. Of course, I always tell them that there's a difference between people like my marketers. Because the marketers, all them do is go out there and talk. I understand that the doers have a major problem. The people who actually go out there, dig up the ground, get these sometimes not highly trained people to put up the blocks and, and so on and so forth. I understand all of that. But it is something that I think we need to pay attention to from the contractor's perspective. We need to get better performance out there. I'm not sure how we're going to start to, to do it. I know that the government has said that performance is going to be one of the major issues taken into the procurement assessment um, process. So from registration, 
they're going to be looking at contractor performance. So the grade that you get will be based on that, as is anything else, your funding, equipment, experience, all of that. Performance will be taken into account in doing that assessment. And from the procuring entity perspective, you are going to have to give a statement on the performance of every contractor who works with you. Which means that going forward, this is going to be a serious issue. And therefore, the way we have operated, where you say, so you understand, man. You know, there's no bly to be given going forward. So it is important for us to work together to ensure that the contractors, one, retool, get the equipment that you need to get so that you can do the work efficiently and effectively. Two, assist in getting training to those persons who are employed in the system. As we increase the amount of work out there, you have to bring in new people. We have to try to see if there's a, a, a cadre of trained people out there. So it is in our interest to work with people like the NHT, and I'm talking from contractor now. Work with the NHT, work with the Heart Trust, and, and these people to get certification widespread in the industry. All right? So, ladies and gentlemen, see, my screen is now blank. <laughs> And it's, and it's not only because of the problems I'm having, because I'm done. I want to thank you for listening. And uh, I will try to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you. And before I address the first slide, I want to address one point about your, your qualification program. Let's take a typical tender call. And let's say, for example, you have five, you have a large project, you divide it into five sections. The contractors must tender, must submit a separate bid for each section. No problem. But you require that that contractor must submit five sets of TCC, the same thing in each bid, five sets of NCC, five sets of audited statement. So those contractors, and I've lived it. Now, I need the slide showing your projection from up to 2021. Five sets. When you finish to submit a bid, you have three to four carton box of a bid. Let's go to Alcan. What? How did they solve it? At January 1, you simply submit your financial statement for the previous years, and you submit your NCC and your TCC. But the NHT required that you repeat this thing. In a typical year, the company that I work for will submit 10 to 15 sets of auditor statement. Why can't you just simply put it on file and move on? So that's a simple solution. And then what happened? Someone put a little bit together, said, oh, I have already given, I am submitting four bits. And this is real, this is very real. This is happens in the last set of tenor, the last set of tenor call. You submit the TCC the same day, same time of opening, but you submit your TCC in three bits. And the three bits are open first, TCC is fine. NCC is fine. The fourth one, you have no TCC. My client says, potential client says, you reject. You are, you are killing an industry. You are killing an industry. That is one. So you're going to have to refine your process. It is not just the contractors that seem not to be facilitating the process. The client must understand they have something to build and need the services of the contractor. That's one. But I want to go back. Right here. You look at 2017, 2018, um, 5,500 housing solution. I could use that. And then 2021, 9,500. You double 
your own projection is doubling. What do you expect to do? If you go back three, four years, your housing stock will be maybe 2,000. What you have, Mr. Moore, is a quantum leap. You have an industry that was humbled. humbled. We don't have enough carpenters, trained and certified carpenters. We don't have enough trained and certified masons. But you, of your own volition, without preparing the industry, the government will now multiply the housing stocks by fivefold using the same industry. No, I, I, I'm mentioning this because you, mentioned, you, 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 you said you don't know whether the local contractors will have the resources. So we are such, we certain who you don't mean that all people from Shenzhen are not doing housing. <laughs> I didn't realize that that was the approach we took for one of the developments that we did in, in, in we got four different tenders for. But I accept and agree that we should put in place some arrangement for almost, as I call it, a first touch, that once you touch the NHT in a year, whatever it is, we need to set a, a, a period. Some of those documentations are captured and we will use those going forward for that period. Just like you have the NCC registration, in a similar way, I believe we can put a, a system in to ensure that contractors, especially the larger ones, need only submit some documents one time for a particular period. We, we, we will look at that. And for the other part, I accept that it is a quantum leap in the amount of work that is being generated through the NHT. It has been significant, no question. And I have been talking, I mean, I talk to my IMAG brethren all the time. Um, and Yes, if it is that we do not see the consistent performance, if we do not get tenders that are at a level that the affordability can be satisfied and it comes some other way, whether it's changing or wherever, or dumb rep or wherever, I, I believe that we would be certainly in the short term forced to look that way as much as we i don't know that we would want to but it, it may be inevitable given as you say what is happening unless the reaction comes swiftly from the other side so far the nht throughout the years i've been there has not used any external contractor consultant or any other resource like that to well except in probably two instances we use uh, some foreign consultants but we, we tend to ensure that the because we generate all our funding locally that it goes back into generating more funding for the nht because people who are then employed will contribute to the nht so it's self-serving as well but yes. And we keep using the term inner city, and it's a bad word in my book. Because the only way we can support or sustain these communities is through integrated housing. So if your housing stock is integrated, then I find you can find a better balance. So you have some for the, the little man, and it can be subsidized. So you find a balance, and even the developer will find a way of find a more affordable solution and balance that equation. If we're all talking about the bottom of the barrel, so you're going to end up with cheap up materials, or you're going to find yourself going to the external source, which we don't want to necessarily go, to find that so-called cheaper solution. So I, I would beg you all to think about all that, because through other parts of the jurisdiction in the world, that inner city model has failed. We must recognize that. Failed badly. Because you can't put all the people of a certain demographics together and expect them to have sustainable situations. 
it doesn't work. You can't have 5,000 poor people can't help themselves. It's, it's something that we continue to discuss, debate, one of the mood points in life. But part of the problem with Jamaica, and I don't know if we have looked at the income profile, but the income profile has such a big base that anytime you do significant housing, there are so many poor people that to, to mix it with a few middle income people or otherwise is, is almost a uh, impossible task. Now, if you look back at those countries we're talking about, all of them, they, they approach it in the same way, but the policy fails as soon as people get, in, in, a, in a general sense, get richer. So once the income profile shifts from this to kind of this, then that approach that you mentioned, Brian, will work. So you, you can put a stratification, you can put 10 people from this income group in there and so on, and it makes a difference. But right now, if we were to do a, we're doing a thousand houses in Montego Bay, for example. Of course, like Greater Portmore, the people who apply are not, never going to be the people down here because just straight, straight income. But at the end of the day, you're still trying to subsidize the solutions for those people who are most vulnerable. And, and the bottom is just so wide that let me tell you, once you do that, you're going to get a community with mainly the people from this area. So, so we do understand, and, and we have the challenges with the inner city housing. I mean, we, we did several projects. I see Norman Anderson here who headed that, that unit. Um, so it's Norman, he must blame for building all of those apartments. <laughs> right, but, but at the end of the day, you know, I've said to them, all right, we went into whichever community, and we build these, at least from the outside, looking good, nice apartments. But just think about what that percentage is amongst all of the people within that community. It's small. When you look at, we build, what, six, how oh, many in, in, in um, Denham Town? All right. But there are thousands of people down there, so this because 300 is kind of drop in a bucket. And that is what has happened to us. <laughs> You know, that's another thing. Um, but, but until the economics trump the politics and until we start to see, as we talk about it, economic growth, and all of us start to, especially those, the, the, the people at the bottom, start to, to see some improvement, then we're going to have the problem. Part of the problem, I thought, with the inner city housing is just that you had too many people yeah, you had too many people in a specific location to fit into a smaller location. So you ended up with a household of 10 persons and we couldn't build, <clears throat> we couldn't build three houses for those 10 persons. So you had an issue, a major issue. What you'd have had to do is say half of those 10 persons who live in that house, some will have to go somewhere else. So that, that's another issue. But anyway, that's, 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 that's not my question. My, my question has to do with um, bond and insurances. Um, clients need to start to think about that quite carefully. You mentioned almost glibly that you do a billion dollar job. And I, my hand went that way, but um, it's not to say that only certain people do billion dollar jobs. But when you talk about when you talk about financing a bond, when you talk about financing a 10% bond for a billion dollar job, I don't know if you calculate your mathematics, you're talking about a hundred million dollars. You have to put up through our banking system asset in respect of a hundred million dollars. 
Now after you have done that, well, if you're doing some smaller jobs, you probably will never have the total asset base to come up to a hundred billion, a hundred million dollars. So you probably can never tender on a billion dollar job. So one of the things I would like us to start to look at is how you deal with bonds and insurances, what you have to put up, how you finance them, and therefore maybe more of us can afford some of those larger projects. The, the, the foreigners who come here don't have to put up all of those things. Based on their history of doing their jobs in their banks and in their insurance companies, they don't have to put up anything. But their insurance companies and bonding companies will write a bond for them. We have a slightly different issue here. I know it's not directly for you, but certainly for clients need to start to think about how they deal with bonds and insurance. Yes, Norman, thanks for that. Uh, just to know that uh, I think the IMAJ had a seminar the other day where that issue was looked at. We have, subsequent to that seminar, been having discussions with one bonding company. They have made some suggestions. We certainly are looking at it. Obviously, I think there is need for some, not just policy, I mean, government. I, I, government, I think, should look at some general policy for its development. Uh, and so I will be having discussions to see how we can do that. But ultimately, I think the industry itself will need to make representation and see how maybe collectively something can be put in place. Um, so IMAJ, I think, ought to, to assist in leading, leading that process. Some years ago, Maurice and I worked in the same place. And we had a program of health centers. And we looked at the default history of Jamaican contractors. And I asked you to look at that again. And we decided that we would bond the program ourselves. So we looked at what it would cost us to pay for bonds, and we put that accumulated amount one side. We never had to call on that bond amount, right? In other words, government should look at the amount of money you pay for bonds and decide whether or not you really need to spend all that money or to keep that money and if you do get one default, again, I ask you to look at default occurrences in our industry in Jamaica, because it really is a sore point. It really is an unabling point, the bonding business, and you really need to look at it. Just to know that I have made a note of this one as well, and I am certainly gonna be looking at it just though from a the perspective of the contractor being responsible. That is the only area that I'd want to, to, to look at a little bit more closely. But certainly we'll look at, at the approach that you mentioned. Well, I recall I've been in master business now, 1970. And I recall when I was a vice president, we had set up a committee to go to the Minister of Finance to try and discuss the parenting called a lean law. And when we got to the Minister of Finance, he looked and he said, you're in the wrong place. I said, why? He said, well, anything else, I can't come with government to paying any bill because I don't know how much money you're going to have from time to time. So he cannot commit and that and he's not going to put the government at a disadvantage. The people are not in pain, however, because at the time, we were only allowed 5% advance payment and contracts. But out of that meeting, we went up to 10. So we made a little progress from that point of view, right? But it, the, the rationale behind that was that government was the main offender. Government was the main offender. And they didn't want to have to be, you know, making a law which will affect them more than anybody else. But I don't know what approach the NHC well, they are going to be working along with us at IMAJ in terms of the lean law to see what we can put in place. So as we make notes of all of these things that we are going to be attacking, um, looking at the overall policy, making rep representation to 
the Minister of Finance who happened to have been a chairman of the National Housing Trust. So at least I, I know him a little bit. So we, we will see how we can get some movement on, on these policies. Um, to add to the bonding issue that you mentioned, on top of the bonding being onerous, there is also a clause in the procurement guideline which states that the, the procuring entity, um, or rather the bonding company, has to pay over the bond to the procuring entity upon its, the first request just by them stating that the contractor is in breach without them needing to offer any further explanation. So having put up your house and your grandma's estate and whatnot and pay a good sum of money, then that money can just be called without you being able to, um, to dispute it. I think the NHT and the HAJ are the only two entities that have actually changed that line in, in their um, performance bond requirements. And um, some entities even go as far as to say the contractor and the bonding company um, uh, gives up their rights, has committed to giving up the right to um, request any further clarity. So it is, it is really, um, I'd say, a violation of natural justice. And that needs to be looked at. And that's actually a procurement deadline by the Ministry of Finance. And that's something that the MAJ will be taking up. And what I'll do, we have a few more days before it becomes law, um, the current one. I'm going to look back at it and see if it is still there. And if it is, I will seek to, to make a suggestion to the Ministry of Finance to have it changed. Because I, I agree with you. I just have one I just have one comment to make because I know how hard pressed you are and we are to try and produce what you call cheaper houses. But I think some time ago I started doing a paper along with the National Housing Trust um, to look at housing costs across the region. What I found, believe it or not, housing in Jamaica is not more expensive than anywhere in the Caribbean. Nowhere, none of the islands, nobody in the Caribbean build cheaper houses than in Jamaica. We, the reality is that Jamaica has the lowest wages in the Caribbean, in case you didn't know. The per capita in Jamaica is 5,000 US dollars. The average across the Caribbean is $12,000. Bahamas is 18, Antigua is 15, Trinidad is 16, and Barbados, I think, is 17. So there are five times. We are the third poorest country in the Caribbean, and so the people at the bottom of the scale are having this difficulty in acquiring homes. But we keep talking about building bamboo houses and bag houses and all that. Good. And ever since I got in the industry, maybe 40 years ago, we are talking about it, and we can't get there. Because simply, the wages and salaries of our people is too low. The master builders, and I, I, I assume the housing trust is going to put a clause when they bring these other guys from wherever to build the houses. But we demand, we are demanding, and I say Mr. Dawes is here that we have worked so hard. When you pay $1,600 a day, the per capita is no longer in 5000 it's gone down to 2500 Those people won't be able to survive. So when we look at housing this stand down, we have to face the fact that the cement, the steel, every strap, 80% of everything in our houses are imported. We can't. The builders will not be able to build any cheaper. We have to look at the earning power of our people. This will what? This is what will make housing more affordable. I, I'm not sure that there's any retort to that at all. Because I agree, fundamentally. But at the same time, I do believe we can come in at a... At some lower prices than we are coming in now. And I believe that when you look at the construction costs over the last, if I were to look over the last three years, I will tell you that I'm seeing significant increases over the last 
six months to uh, 12 months, six months. And, and I believe it is because there is no a lack of competition out there. I, I really think so. I, I, when I look at most of the larger contractors, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to, to see where they're getting the resources from in terms of equipment and so on, because they have a lot of work. That, that's my own, own um, assessment. All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for what I really thought was a, a good question and answer session. <laughs> I, I like the questions. It, I think it's something that we need to keep going. We need to have this kind of collaboration because we must, at the end of the day, be able to impact on the policies that drive this industry. And I think it is important for the master builders, IMAJ, to be so organized and to bring in so many partners that not only can they be able to deliver what I want, which is to build cheaper houses, but also to have the impacts on the policy makers that we all, ourselves and our people, will benefit. All right? And as Dan said, get the GDP going north. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll make a short, sweet vote of thanks as I stand between you and the door. Um, a lot of you have given some time out of your day to engage with us at our luncheon. Uh, these events are about engagement about knowledge sharing between fellow industry members uh, fellow stakeholders and the people that we work with and can learn things from can debate things with and move the industry forward on behalf of the executive the council members the secretariat of the incorporated master builders I'd like to just thank the National Housing Trust, Sir Donald Moore, the staff, uh, Terranova and their staff for feeding us and hosting us today, for helping us to continue the lunch and series. And we're definitely looking forward to this crowd and more. I said I'd make it sweet, so thank you. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to seeing you in the future.